Today I present to you an exciting audio tool developed by BBC Research and Development that allows you to turn your phone, your laptop, your tablet into an interconnected system of surround sound speakers, among other things. Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name's Kirsten and I'm an audiovisual artist under the name Naoki. I've also recently written the book Performing Electronic Music Live and one of my chapters talks about how you can program a custom audio tool for performance from scratch. So this chapter has three really exciting tutorials that have been created by various friends and colleagues of mine. So this video actually accompanies that chapter but you can of course also watch this video if you haven't read the chapter. If however you want to know more about what electronic artists do on stage please do check out my book, which I will link down below in the description. So today's video has been created by two special guests. The first guest is Dr. John Frankham, who I met during my PhD times at Surrey University, where he began researching audio device orchestration technologies. He now co-leads the audio team at BBC Research and Development. So in just a moment's time he's going to give you a tutorial on audio orchestrator and he's also going to use an audio drama to show you what this tool can do. And then the second guest is Professor Stephen Davis Moon. He's a professor at Liverpool Hope University, a press and music, and he researches electronic music in the contemporary classical repertoire. He's also been a composer for over 20 years and he's currently planning a really interesting and unusual music theatre piece involving audio orchestrator. So he's going to tell you a little bit more about that at the end of this video. But for now, I'm going to pass over to John for the tutorial part of this video. Hi, I'm John Frankham. I co-lead the audio team at BBC Research and Development where we help the BBC to deliver innovative and high quality audience experiences. I currently lead some work on a technology that we call audio device orchestration. Device orchestration is about using any available devices as part of a media reproduction system. So for example, connecting together the wide variety of devices that are in the home that can play back sound like mobiles, laptops and tablets. So they all form part of the same sound system. And that's beneficial because we can deliver really good listening experiences with things like surround sound systems, but they're not particularly common. So trying to deliver a good sound experience with devices that people already own should help us to unlock that type of experience for many more audience members. We started experimenting with this technology in the S3A Future Spatial Audio Research Project, which was a collaboration with the universities of Surrey, Salford and Southampton, as well as BBC R&D. And since then, we've designed a, pr a production tool called Audio Orchestrator to allow creatives to easily experiment with orchestrated audio. And that production tool handles three aspects of an orchestrated system, which are pairing, so making sure the system knows about the available devices and that it can send audio to them. Synchronization, making sure that those devices can play back audio in sync with each other. And then the audio playback, choosing which bits of the audio to send to which device and we use object-based audio and a rule set for allocating the sounds to devices. Audio Orchestrator is freely available for non-commercial purposes from BBC MakerBox, which provides tools for the creative community and a platform for discussion and sharing of experiences and knowledge. So you can request access to Audio Orchestrator on the MakerBox website. I'll put a link in the video description. Uh, you'll just need to fill in a short form and read and sign and return some terms and conditions of use and then you'll be sent a download link and some installation instructions. In this tutorial I'll explain the basics of making a project with Audio Orchestrator, um, full documentation is available online, again links below, and there's also the MakerBox forum if you have any problems or questions. Before I go any further, I would like to highlight the fantastic contributions that many of my colleagues have made to this work. In particular, Christian Henschel has led the software development, but many others have really made essential contributions as well. In the Audio Orchestrator tutorial, I'm going to use content from a trial production called The Vostok K Incident. And that was a short science fiction audio drama. It was the first orchestrated trial production that we released as part of the S3A project. 
It works as a stereo audio drama on the main device, but you can also connect additional phones, tablets and laptops to be extra speakers that get uh, elements like dialogue, sound design or ambient sound or even additional content that isn't present in the main stereo mix. So I'll just show a quick demo of what the Vostok incident looks like, which should help when it comes to explaining how to recreate it in Audio Orchestrator. You won't be able to hear the spatial audio effect in this tutorial, but the Vostok K incident is available online for you to try out. Again, I'll add the link in the description. So in Vostok, when you click start on the main device, you land in this loading loop, a short content loop that plays before the main piece while you connect in devices. You can see the instructions for connecting devices, including a QR code. And you'll notice that the, the session that you've started has a six digit pairing code. So I'll just copy the link and put it into a new browser tab to simulate a mobile phone that I'm connecting. I can type in the pairing code, which will connect me into the same session. And once I'm connected, I can see a control on the screen that I can use to say where in space I'm going to place this device. Once I'm ready, I'll click continue on the main device and that moves to the next sequence of content, which is the main piece, about 13 minutes long. You can see that the two devices I have are playing in sync with each other. So that's all I'll show for now before moving over to the Audio Orchestrator production tool, where I'll show you how to recreate something like the Vostok K incident. The output from Audio Orchestrator is a web application that won't look exactly the same as Vostok, but it's designed to have all of the same functionality and some more, and to be reusable for different experiences. If you'd like to work along with the Vostok tutorial, you can request access to the content from the Vostok K incident from the S3A project website. Again, I'll add all of these links below. The basic workflow for an audio orchestrator project is to author your audio files using whatever software you like, import them into audio orchestrator and define your experience, and then preview or export the experience that you've built. And I'll talk through the process in more detail now. Once you've installed the software and opened it up, you'll see the home page. Click create a new project and choose a file name for that project and where you'd like to save it. And you'll see in my directory, I already have a folder called audio and a folder called images. And that's best practice for setting up your project, particularly if you're moving projects between different computers, because Audio Orchestrator will be able to automatically relink any media files that are in this uh, same directory as the project file. Once you've made your empty project, you'll be taken to the sequences page. And across the top of the window, you can see five pages, sequences, controls, audio, appearance and export. You can move between those in any order, and if you just want to get started, then the audio page is probably the best place for that, but I'll work through them in, in that order for now. So we start on the sequences page. A sequence is an independent section of content. One experience might have a number of sequences that can relate to each other in different ways. So they could progress linearly, or they could allow for branching based on decisions made by the listener. In the Vostok K incident, we had two sequences, a loading loop to give listeners time to connect their devices and the main piece. So I'll start by changing the name of the first sequence to loading loop and then making a second sequence and calling that main piece. I can set the flow between sequences in the sequence destinations drop down. From the loading loop, I want the user to be able to choose to continue to the main piece when they're ready. So I'll set my destination sequence to main piece and label the button continue. From the main piece, I just want a listen again option. In that case, the sequence destination is itself. And again, I'll label the button. In the sequence settings drop down, I can customize some properties of the sequences. For the loading loop, I just want it to continue looping until the user makes a choice, so I'll set loop this sequence. For the main piece, I don't want a loop. At the end of the piece, the listen again button should become visible and wait for some user input. And I don't need to change any of the default settings to achieve that. There's a lot to take in on each page of Audio Orchestrator, um, so it's good to remember that you can always consult the documentation and on each page you can just click the question mark button that appears next to the page title and that links straight to the relevant documentation pages. 
So we've got two sequences set up, so let's move on to the controls page. A control is a way for the user of your experience to interact with the piece on their devices. It can be linked up later with how the audio objects are allocated to those devices. If you click add control, you can see the variety of control types that can be used with Audio Orchestrator. For the Vostok K incident, users could specify where they'd put each connected device. And for that, I want a radio buttons type control, where the user will be able to select one option from the possibilities that you define. I'm going to name that device position, and I'll add some options that the user will be able to choose between. Near front, near rear, near side, far front, far rear and far side are the options for positioning the device in the Vostok K incident. I want to leave no value selected by default, but if I wanted to, I could also specify a default value. And below those options, I can set up some properties of the control. In this case, that control should only appear on connected auxiliary devices, so I'll select aux devices only, and I want the control to be visible in both of my two sequences, so that the aux devices can be set up by the user during the loading loop, so I don't need to change anything there. I could add as many different controls as I like, and then later set up how they affect the audio objects. But for Vostok, that's the only control we need, so let's move on to the audio page. On the audio page, you can see tabs for the two sequences that we made in the first step. I'm going to import audio files into each of these sequences. There are some requirements for my audio files. They need to be mono or stereo WAV files. They each need to be the same length within each sequence, and the file names need to start with ascending numbers, and that's all detailed in the documentation. So I'll click Add Audio Files and find the audio files for the loading loop sequence, and you can see we've got six files here. Next to each audio object, each file, is a panning setting, and then you can see some behaviours, and I'll come back to what these behaviours mean in a bit. But next, I'll just load in the audio files for the main sequence, in the full piece of the Vostok K incident, there were around 60 audio objects, but I'm just going to use a subset of those now so that we can more clearly see what's going on with the behaviours and the audio routing. At this point, we've got audio files in. We're pretty much ready to go for a basic experience, and we could skip ahead to previewing now, but in this project, I want to set up some more complicated rules for the audio routing, and I'm going to start with the main piece. So I can add behaviours to my audio objects. Behaviours define how the sounds should be routed to the devices that are connected, and they enable the experience to flexibly adapt to the number of available devices while still doing what the content producer wants. They can account for information about the devices that are connected or that the user has entered through controls like the one that I set up earlier. There are four different types of behaviours. They're called fixed behaviours, control link behaviours, custom behaviours, and the images and effects behaviour. I'll go through each of those types now. So starting with the fixed behaviours, those are the two grey boxes that you see displayed for every object. The first determines the device role that objects are routed to. So that could be the main device, the connected aux devices, or either role. And then the second determines the number of devices. So that could just be one device, which would be the most appropriate one based on other behaviours. Or it could be multiple devices, any that match the behaviours that you've set up. For this example, we have a stereo file that's meant to play from the main device only. The first character dialogue, which is Sam, who can play from any device type. And then the next character, which is the General and Tatiana, should only play from AUX devices, and so should the cockpit sound effects. And then the final object should play from the main device only. It fills in some gaps if the General and Tatiana is not allocated, and again we'll come back to that in a, in a bit. The cockpit sound effects should play from any applicable devices, whilst the other objects should only play once they're in, only in one device only. So moving on to control linked behaviours, which are directly related to the controls that we set up earlier. They show at the top of the list with orange dots, and they can be used for very basic use cases, like determining whether or not an object is allowed to be allocated to devices with certain control settings. But in the Vostok K incident, we actually need more fine-grained control than that of what should happen to the object, so we need to use custom behaviours instead. 
There are various different types of custom behaviour. They appear below the control link behaviours in the list, and they each do different things. And this is where it can get pretty complicated. So if you're struggling with what to do or how to achieve what you want, you can access the documentation by clicking on the question mark icon or asking in the MakerBox community forum, and we're really happy to support with that kind of thing. I'll start with Sam's dialogue. I'm going to link this up to the device position control that I set up previously. And what I want is for ideally Sam to come from a near front device. So I can use a preferred if behavior to set that. If there isn't a preferred device available, then I don't mind Sam coming from some of the other positions, but we made a production decision that he shouldn't be behind the listener. So I'm gonna use the prohibited if behavior and I'll set that so that Sam isn't allowed in the near rear or far rear positions. Moving on, the General and Tatiana object is some extra content. It's an interview between the characters looking back on the events that happened in the drama. When we were producing the drama, we felt it was really important that this went in a device of its own. It didn't get mixed in with the other sound designs. And we can use the exclusive behaviour to make that happen. The exclusive behaviour will stop any other sounds being allocated to the same device. And we actually didn't want that to happen if there was only one device connected. We wanted the other sounds to go into that device. So we set a threshold so that the content, that uh, extra general and Tatiana content, could only play if there were more than two connected devices. I can do that with the allowed if behavior again. So it's allowed if the number of devices currently connected is greater than two. I'm just gonna add one more behavior to the Tatiana broken object. I mentioned earlier that we only want that object to play if the general and Tatiana track is not allocated. So for example, if there aren't enough devices connected, just like we just set up. So there are a few ways to achieve this, but I'll use the mute if behavior and set the reference object to general and Tatiana. So the Tatiana broken object will be muted if the general and Tatiana is allocated and otherwise it will play. The final behavior type is the images and effects behavior. I can use that to add timed images that are attached to audio objects and therefore use the same behavior driven allocation rules. So as an example, I'll pick an image that will be displayed on the device that Sam is allocated to. I add the behavior, add an image item, and then choose my image. I can set the timing. For this simple example, I just want the full sequence, but I could have multiple images that change during the timeline. I can also add lighting effects. I'll add a flashing yellow pattern to the general and Tatiana object to demonstrate that. Again, I add the images and effects behavior, add an item, and then set up my effect. Audio Orchestrator adapts to different numbers of devices by making sure that it allocates objects in the best way every time there's some change in the reproduction setup. So for example, when a listener uses a control or when a new device is added or a device drops out. I'm going to add one last behavior called change management, which can be used to limit what can happen to objects when these changes happen. I'm going to apply the same change management behavior to all of the objects, which I can do by selecting multiple objects before adding the behavior. And I'll just leave the default settings, which mean that the objects can move to more preferred devices, but will try to stay in the same device where possible. Again, there are more details on all of the settings of this in the documentation. So we've authored some behaviors and we're pretty much ready to have a listen. First, I'll just use the appearance page to customize the experience. Here I can set a title, subtitle, and some introductory text. I can change the color scheme, and I can choose and add a cover image. There are also some further settings that I can tweak, um, including audio settings like dynamic range compression and a fade out that's applied when objects are no longer allocated to devices.
Once that's all ready, I can go to the export tab. You'll see that the validation status shows that there aren't any errors in the project, so we're ready to go. And I can either preview the experience in the browser or export it to host on my own web server. For now, I'll preview, so it just takes a short moment to process the files and then gives me a link to open in the browser. Using the preview mode, I'll be able to connect any devices that are on the same network, but if you've exported and hosted the application, devices on any network can connect in. In the browser, we see the Audio Orchestrator template web application with the image that we added. I'll start a session and we're in the loading loop. Then I can follow the connection instructions to add a second device. On that second device, you can see that it's playing in sync with the main device, and you can also see the device position control that we set up in Audio Orchestrator. Once that's done, back on the main device, I can close the connection instructions and click continue to go to the main piece where I set up some behaviours. We can see that on the main device, three objects are allocated, the main device stereo, Sam and Tatiana broken. And the image that I added to Sam's object is shown. If I go to the AUX device and select one of Sam's preferred locations, he should jump to that AUX device. The next thing to see is that the General and Tatiana interview object isn't allocated. Let's add another device which should get just that object. The mute if behaviour will have kicked in so that the Tatiana broken object doesn't play, but you can still see the label because it's still allocated, just with a game change. As I mentioned, I could have used a different combination of behaviours that would stop it being allocated altogether. I hope that's been a useful overview of how you can use Audio Orchestrator to create multi-device audio experiences. The process is reasonably straightforward, but getting the behaviours right can be a bit tricky. We're working on a monitoring system that should make it quicker and easier to check that you've achieved what you were aiming for. And we're always happy to help out. The MakerBox forum is a great place to ask any questions that you have. And all the links to the forum, the um, other resources, the documentation are included uh, below this video. So thanks to John for this brilliant tutorial. I hope you can see just how powerful and versatile Audio Orchestrator is. Maybe you even feel inspired to try it out for yourself. If so, just check out the links in the description. Next up, I'm going to pass over to Stephen, who's going to tell you about his work so far and also his plans of using Audio Orchestrator for his upcoming interesting and unusual music theatre piece. My name is Stephen Davis Moon. I'm the Associate Dean of the Creative Campus at Liverpool Hope University and also Professor of Composition. I was very excited to hear about the work of John Frankham's team and that of the audio orchestrator in particular. Um, similarly, I was also very excited to hear about the, the new publication on live electronic music by Dr. Kirsten Hermes. I was delighted to be invited by both um, John Frankham and, and Dr. Kirsten Hermes to, um, to make this short video uh, about a new project that I'm working on that will incorporate the audio orchestrator in something of a new way. I've been working with um, live electronic music um, for well over 20 years anyway um, in, in variety of um, utilizing a variety of means whether that's from the old days of using um, analog circuitry and so on for the transformation, live transformation of, of sounds, um, instruments or voices through um, a variety of other um, digital platforms <clears throat> to make multi-channel spatial interactive audio works for a, a variety of, of, um, of circumstances, whether that be for the, the concert hall, for theatrical performances, or, or sound installations as well. In terms of 
multi-channel sound installations. I made a piece uh, for the uh, Temporiali studios in, in Florence, whereby I um, made a, a multi-channel, almost like a, an umbrella that would sit over the audience and um, traced the, the life of the Arno River that runs right away through um, Tuscany in Italy. Another piece that I think is relevant to mention here is um, a piece that I made called Thrones, which is a, um, a sound installation piece, multi-channel sound installation piece, whereby the, um, the audience members within the installation play the installation. They, they play the room, so to speak. And this is achieved by way of technologies such as um, local area network, touch OSC, um, Maxim SP and Ableton Live um, brought together. The idea being that the audience members would um, pick up some iPads that are placed in the central table of the installation. The space of the installation has four sets of stereo pairs, each placed in the corner of the space. And then the audience members are, are free to, to, to mix and to transform by way of a variety of DSP techniques the sounds that are coming from, from their corner of the room, so to speak. Um, so by that way, whilst it is fixed media that's being played back in that installation, no two soundings of that installation would, would or could ever be the same. This new piece that I'm um, in the throes, if you like, of writing is a music theatre piece based upon the, the novel of John le Carre, A Most Wanted Man. What I'm aiming to do with the work is to make um, many, many um, audio files that will be available for playback at certain points within the, within the drama as it unfolds. Um, the audience members, as they come into the auditorium, will be invited to, to sign up, if you like, to the, to the host um, for this piece. And then, depending upon their seated position, certain sounds will emit from their smartphones. And what I'm designing is that a multitude of sound streams could be playing back at the same time. And so, therefore, depending upon where the audience members are seated, there will be different layerings of sound. Also, I'm wanting to create a, an audio swarming um, effect, if you like. And I imagine to, to do this, I'll create um, many versions of similar sounds. So that might be traffic sounds, it might be certain instrumental sounds, um, or sounds of nature or whatever, and that they could emit in a, in a swarm-like way. So you, it's not going to be the same um, audio file being played back at the same time. There will be a, um, a multiple layering of a, of a self-similar sound to, to, to give more an organic quality um, to the playback of the sound. These are the main techniques that I'll be employing. But from a creative point of view, the utilisation of this type of technology will bring to life in a, in a new way fixed media audio, making it organic, making it comment upon the narrative. It will emanate from the, um, from the audience, so therefore making the, um, the dramatic narrative take place not just within the, the fixed um, cross arch, if you like, performance area, but will make it much more mobile um, and a much more immersive, um, interactive experience as well. And this level of interactivity will also be, I hope, heightened by way of, of, of choices um, for the audience members as to, to which type of audio stream they will wish to emit from their smartphone at certain points. Above all, I believe that Audio Orchestrator, alongside the, the live singing, the live voices, the live musicians, the other audio streams that will be played back uh, with the piece will make for um, a very, very interesting um, new dimension 
for a mobile listening experience for the audience members. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye for now. Some really exciting ideas there and I can't wait to find out more about Stephen's project. So I hope you feel inspired to give Audio Orchestrator a go. Like I've said, I've put all the links down below in the description and you can take it from there. Uh, if you want to see more tutorials about how to perform electronic music live in various different ways, please do make sure to subscribe to my channel and press the bell for notifications. Also let me know in the comments down below if you've ever used uh, a more experimental audio program that goes beyond kind of the standard DAWs that most people use. Uh, I'd love to find out more. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!